Yeah, we'll call the meeting to order. Um, and why don't you do like a, an, an, a roll call? Okay. Uh, Councilor Johnson? No. Uh, Chair Bridges? Yes. Molly Olson? Angel Aguilar? Yep. Sorry, Don't. Molly Olson's here learning to find the unmute button. Thank you. <laughs> okay, Molly's there. Good. Uh, Don Clements. Joe Morlock. I am here. Francisco Stoller. Here. Lonnie Parrish. Here. Don Griswold. Shannon right. Buckmaster. Here. And Cassandra Ullman. Here. Thank you all. So with that, Mr. Chair, you in the past have kind of walked through what we're going to talk about tonight. So you should see it on your screen. Um, if for some reason you don't have screen, you don't have access, we did mail out your packet last week and the PowerPoint was included in that packet as reference. So, John, you want to say anything about the agenda or you want me to kind of go over it? Well, um, no, we, uh, I'm not going to say anything about the agenda. Um, I don't know if we are going to have a public comment section. Uh, the, it was posted out there so people can, could call in. I don't anticipate we'll probably get anybody on the call this evening, but you never know. Okay. I do have at the bottom of my screen a Q&A. So if people call in, I think they can post a question and I will see it at the bottom of my screen. So I'll keep an eye on that. Okay. Um, and I don't know, uh, Doug, if you wanted to do something in terms of going over the whole agenda before we get to the consent calendar, is that what you were thinking? Uh, well, the first thing to do, so we called to order, we did the roll call, uh, public comments, uh, we can address later. So we can move on to number four, which is the consent calendar and the approval of the minutes. Okay. Um, it's actually item three on my, uh, Roman numeral three on the agenda that was mailed out just for record keeping. Um, so first off, uh, J Doug and I talked today, our minutes in the future won't be as lengthy as this. This is more like a transcript. Right. Um, and I noted that there was a, a, a number of errors um, and I don't wanna really necessarily spend time correcting all the errors. The only one I really care about is that there was an error in the motion. And so I just wanted to make a record that <clears throat> the motion as made by Shannon Buckmaster uh, in the third line down where it uses the word additions, E-D-I-T-I-O-Ns, uh, should be additions, like additional land that will be added uh, to the high density parcel. Do you see where that is, Doug? Yep, I've got it. Okay, um, this, I'll call for the rest of the group um, to identify other uh, additions, changes, or uh, anything they'd like to correct in the minutes, just keeping in mind that I don't think we need to go deep into the weeds on that. Any other changes? None here. Okay, then I would entertain a motion to approve those minutes. So moved. Could you identify who you were? Uh, Angel. Okay, and a second, and please identify who you are. This is Molly, second. All right. Any discussion on that? All right. All those in favor of the minutes with that one correction uh, indicate by saying aye. 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 Uh, anybody? Aye. Okay. Thank you. Anybody opposed use the same sign? All right. Well, let's move on then. And uh, let's move on to the new business portion. So, Elaine, this is for you. Yes. Um, and Nick. Advance the screen one. Okay. Oh, oh, oh. There we go. So, we, we have 
Two items of new business. The first is the financial analysis and Nick Popinuk of Tiberius Solutions, who um, partners with me on all of our urban renewal work is also on the call and he will be going through those slides. And then at the end, we want to talk about what we had slated as an open house and Doug and Lacey of his staff uh, and I talked about that a bit today and we have some ideas, so we want to go through that. So next slide. This is just the boundary in case we need to look back at it for any reason. And it is a boundary which Nick and his group used for the financial analysis. It did not change after uh, we talked last time. We were able to put together information on the, um, was this slide updated, Doug? Uh, this is the PowerPoint that we sent. Um, yeah, this is the updated one. Okay. The, the acreage uh, amount and the assessed value amount uh, as a percentage of the city of Newburgh. When we talked at the first meeting, we talked about that the limitations are 25% of both assessed value and acreage. And the assessed value is well below the 25% at 7.80%. And the acreage is 16.74%. And wh while Nick's going through some of the financials, I'm gonna double check that number because it seemed like, uh, I might have changed that number. So, um, but we're still well under 25%. I'm gonna double check that as, as we move forward here. I know. Next slide. Nick will start going through his procedures and what he's come up with on his financial analysis. Okay, thank you, Elaine. So as Elaine said, Nick Popinuk with Tiberius Solutions and I'm a public finance consultant uh, doing uh, a lot of this urban renewal work across the state for the last decade. Um, mostly I'm here to talk about our preliminary forecasts of financial capacity for this urban renewal area. But those forecasts are all underpinned by assumptions on future growth in assessed value for the URA. And before we start talking about those uh, potential future growth in assessed value, it's helpful as context to look at the historical growth in value that the broader area has seen. So this is showing uh, growth in real market value and in assessed value uh, since 2008 for the county and the city. Um, one thing to keep in mind is that in Oregon, there is a big difference between real market value and assessed value. So real market value tends to be very volatile, changing annually based on market conditions. Assessed value tends to plot along slow and steady uh, at 3% per year, unless there's new construction that happens that boosts that rate above 3%. And so we can certainly see that here where real market value over the last decade or so has been a roller coaster where you get more than 10% growth one year and then drops of 10% uh, a following year. Uh, meanwhile, assessed value in the area, uh, neither the county nor the city has ever seen a loss in assessed value from one year to the next during this past uh, 12 years of history. So even during the depths of the Great Recession, assessed value continued to increase in both of these jurisdictions. Uh, likewise, it's pretty uncommon for the, these areas to see growth in assessed value that is particularly high. And so we see most of the time it hovers around four, five, six percent. Um, long term average for the county has been right around five percent. And for the city, it's been around five and a half percent. So that, that's sort of historical context as we move forward into our projections. And Doug, the next slide. Uh, can I ask a quick question on that? Uh, that same slide there. Sure. I the anomaly in 2019, where it's just far beyond anything else we had seen in the previous years. What is that? Can you talk to that point? What is it that gave us that 12.76 in the city? So I have not dug into that yet. Okay. So that was definitely on my radar too. 
I don't know if Doug or any other city staff folks might happen to know off the top of their head what might have caused such a large spike in assessed value last year. Um, but that's definitely something that caught my eye and that we plan on looking into unless the city happens to have an answer right now. Uh, no, Nick, I, I, like you, I'd have to dig in to find out why that 12.76% occurred. But, but we definitely will look into that because it, it is such an outlier when we're looking at the historical trends here. All right. Thank you. Um, so the, uh, the next uh, slide here, it's all the exact same data that we were just looking at, but now it's in a chart instead of a table. Uh, the dashed lines represent the real market value. The solid lines are the assessed value, blue for the county and orange for the city. And again, it just goes to show that the assessed value figures tend to be fairly consistent. Real market values can be all over the board and that the city and the county tend to stick fairly close together. Um, not a huge uh, difference between those two long term. Uh, so then our next slide. <clears throat> so this is really, really the crux of our analysis and it's a whole lot of numbers on one slide, but I'm gonna walk us through um, all of it. What we're looking at is the financial capacity of the urban renewal area, looking at several different measures of capacity and showing four different growth scenarios for how fast assessed value could grow in the area. Our growth scenarios range from 4% to 7% in assessed value each year. 4% um, would be a pretty conservative assumption. That's less than we've seen the average growth for the county and the city being. However, we are entering a recession at the moment. Uh, a lot of the development potential in this area is for industrial property and large industrial sites can be unpredictable. So you could have a huge amount of new value coming on the tax rolls very soon, or it could sit and languish for a number of years waiting for just the right buyer and developer to come on board. So while 4% is conservative, it's also a realistic alternative for what could happen here. The 5% and 6% numbers are just on either side of the historical trend uh, for the city as a whole. And so that would represent this area receiving about its fair share uh, of the growth that the city gets uh, long term. 7% uh, looks like a bit of an aggressive assumption, uh, especially compared to historical numbers. But there is a lot of opportunity for new construction in this urban renewal area. And in particular, again, the industrial property could have one development that takes place uh, that could really catapult this trajectory onto a higher, uh, higher tr uh, sort of trend line here. Um, so those are the scenarios that we've run. However, talking about them just in terms of percentages seems pretty theoretical to me. So the next line down on that table, the average annual exception value in 2020 dollars, this tries to make those scenarios more realistic. So this is saying how much new assessed value would have to come onto the tax rolls every year on average in order to achieve the growth rates that we're talking about. So we know that properties should continue to get 3% appreciation regardless of new construction. How much new construction do we need to achieve our 4%, 5%, 6% scenarios? So in the 4% growth rate scenario, that would require, require only about $1.8 million of new construction activity taking place each year. 5% scenario would require over $4 million of new assessed value each year. 6% scenario, we're looking at 7.7 .7 million of new assessed value. And then in that 7% scenario, it would require $12 million of new assessed value coming on the tax rolls every year. So while the differences between 4% growth and 7% growth might not sound that big when you're talking about just the percentages, the amount of new construction value sustained long term in order to get that difference in growth, you know, 12 million a year versus 1.8 million a year, those are pretty stark contrasts in terms of how the future of this urban renewal area would unfold. Um, 
And one thing, again, this is the average amount of new construction that would be required to achieve these growth rates. Uh, seldom do we see urban renewal areas where you get the same amount of growth every year. There are going to be uh, high points and low points. Uh, some years where you don't see any new construction at all. Other years where you have one huge project that uh, sustains you for years to come. Uh, so even in that high scenario, it's, it's not unrealistic to think of an industrial developer putting $120 million of new investment into the area in one year that would be enough to cover a decade worth of growth in that high scenario. Um, so that sort of uh, is the outline of the four growth scenarios we're looking at. Now I'll sort of walk through the results of our financial projection. So we show that financial capacity uh, with three different figures, uh, total net TIF, maximum indebtedness, and then capacity in 2020 dollars. That total net TIF is the actual amount of tax increment finance revenue that the urban renewal area would be expected to collect over its lifespan. And that's going to be equal to the foregone revenues that the taxing districts will experience. So in a minute, Elaine will talk about the impacts to taxing districts. And there is a one-to-one -one ratio there in terms of impact to taxing districts and the net TIF revenue that the urban renewal area receives. That is the, uh, I'd say maybe the most accurate term for the financial capacity of an urban renewal area, but it can also be pretty misleading because that is in future dollars, year of expenditure dollars, and a dollar 20 years from now is not worth the same as a dollar today. And that's also the amount of money that you'll have available to pay for both the principal amount of your projects and the interest on any debt that you incur in order to fund those. So in the 4% scenario where it's showing $62 million of net TIF, uh, folks should not interpret that to mean that you could go out with a $62 million shopping list today and fund all of the projects. So our next measure, uh, maximum indebtedness, is where we distinguish between the principal amount that you're funding on projects and the interest that you're paying on debt long-term. And so we go, again, just looking at the 4% scenario, we go from 62 million to 52.7. The difference between those two is roughly $10 million that we're anticipating would be spent on interest over the life of the urban renewal area. Uh, the remaining amount, 52.7, is a total principal amount that could be spent on projects. This maximum indebtedness figure is key because by state statute, that is the limiting factor for urban renewal areas. So when the city council, if it adopts an urban renewal plan, it is required to state a maximum indebtedness. That's the total amount that can be spent on projects in the area and that cannot be exceeded. That is the limit on urban renewal. That number is still a little misleading if you're trying to understand the financial capacity today because again, it is in nominal year of expenditure dollars, but a lot of those dollars aren't gonna be available for many years down the road. So we look at the timing of when those dollars will be available and we adjust for assumed inflation long-term and we wind up with our estimated capacity in today's dollars. So that's the 2020 estimate there. And that shows in the 4% scenario, 29.2 million. And that is the uh, most useful estimate of financial capacity. So that's the row that you would look at if you're trying to put together a project list. Uh, if you wanted to fund this road and that sewer improvement, et cetera, you'd wanna make sure that your total project costs don't exceed that capacity line there in 2020 dollars. Uh, the remaining rows underneath that show you estimate portions of that total capacity would be available over time uh, because it's not all available on day one. In fact, relatively little money is available in the early years and it's really gradual increases in revenue long term. Um, a couple of caveats about the results shown here. One is that for all of these in this initial round of analysis, we assumed a 30 year duration for the urban renewal area. 
while that is a reasonably common uh, duration that we see, it is not set in stone. There's no reason it would have to be that long. Could be longer, could be shorter. Uh, if you want to try and do your own calculations to say that uh, 30 years seems like an awful long time, what if we held it to 25? What if we held it to 20? You could start subtracting the values that are shown in those last couple of rows of the table. Um, so for example, if we look at the, the high growth scenario where we are showing a, uh, what is our total capacity there? 74.4 million uh, in capacity in today's dollars for projects over 30 years. If you only wanted to have an urban renewal area for 25 years instead, you would subtract that bottom 17.9 million. And that would show you that a 25 year plan at that high growth rate would have capacity for 56 and a half million uh, for funding of projects in today's dollars. Um, one sort of last point before we move on is that these are projections, but they're all based on assumptions of what that growth and assessed value is going to be. And we have no control over what that assumption, or what the actual growth will be. We don't have a perfect crystal ball. If we had been doing this analysis three months ago, we might have had a very different picture in our head of what the economy would look like going forward than what we have now. And three months from now, we might also have a very different picture in our head. So these are to provide context for a range of scenarios. Ultimately, it's going to be uh, up to this group and the city to recommend a maximum indebtedness figure and to understand what that likely relates to in terms of how long the urban renewal area would be in existence in order to achieve that maximum indebtedness. And so hopefully this provides context uh, for estimating what is a reasonable and appropriate uh, threshold for what this urban renewal area should be trying to fund. Uh, and with that, I think I have one more brief slide on maximum indebtedness, and then we'll maybe pause yeah. for questions on that. Yeah. Let, let me jump in here, Doug. Patrick Johnson um, was not able to log in on the regular link. If you go to the bottom of your screen under participants. I, I sent it to him, Elaine. I oh, sent it to him already. Okay. So yeah, he, I'm in. I'm sorry, guys. My uh, iPad was dead, so sorry about that. Okay. Sorry, Nick. Yeah, move it forward, Doug. Okay. <laughs> okay so this, this slide, much easier to get through than the last one. Um, this is just showing that on the last slide, we had these calculations of the financial capacity that could be achieved. But maximum indebtedness also has a legal threshold. Uh, you cannot establish a maximum indebtedness more than X amount determined by formula. That formula has to do with the initial frozen base value of the urban renewal area. Based on what the property values are today and how much we expect them to grow in the, the coming year when the next tax roll is released, we think that the maximum statutorily allowed maximum indebtedness would be around 146 to 148 million. Uh, on our high forecast of 7% for 30 years, we are looking at a maximum indebtedness of 138 million. So it does start to get up near that maximum allowed amount, uh, which means that if folks had a bigger wish list than that that they were trying to fund, this urban renewal area would not be allowed to really go much further. Um, and you know, I don't, I don't know that there's really any demand or appetite to be looking at urban renewal areas that go longer than 30 years. But if there were, uh, this is just showing that the statutory limit actually would, would cut that off and say, no, no more than 146, 148 million. And in fact, in order to be prudent and given the uncertainty in establishing what the frozen base really is, it's best to try not to go right up to that total limit, but to leave yourself some cushion just in case your numbers, the actual wind up being different from your projections. So that's all on the financials. Uh, and I realized that was quite a data uh, dump that I provided there for everybody. So I'll pause if there are questions on understanding all that. Yeah, I have a question. Um, did you, uh, can you give us the uh, growth for the last 10 years, excluding that 2019 number? Uh, 
I certainly could. Uh, I don't have it off the top of my head, but yeah, but that being such a large outlier, I can I can run that calculation for you pretty quickly here. So I'm I'm I can I can get that answer to you before the end of this uh, Zoom Zoom meeting for sure. Okay. And then um, Elaine, is there or maybe this is a question for Nick? Is there a typical approach that communities take to uh, selecting one of these numbers? I think there's um, two parts to that answer and I'll let Nick deal with, with a part of which growth rate. Um, and then once you pick which growth rate and he goes through that, then you pick the time frame. So Nick, why don't you deal with how, how we end up on a growth rate, knowing that in the feasibility study, we'll put all of this information in for the city council to review. And it will be probably between the feasibility study and if they decide to go ahead with the plan that the actual number is settled on after recommendations, both from the advisory committee and city council review and staff review. Go ahead, Nick. Yeah, so on uh, establishing a growth rate, um, it really is a tension between wanting to make sure that you're being prudent and conservative and uh, not assuming pie in the sky projections that are going to be unreasonable and set yourself up for failure long term, while also not being so overly conservative uh, that you aren't giving yourself any room to capture future construction. And in reality, you wind up having more growth, but you've already set such a low maximum indebtedness for yourself that you can't really take advantage of that growth. And all you do is wind up shutting down your urban renewal plan very early because you achieved your maximum indebtedness much faster than you anticipated. So it really is a balancing act of trying to say, what do we think is the most likely outcome here. And based on that, is that a comfortable impact to the taxing districts that are helping to fund this urban renewal area? Is this dollar amount gonna be enough to fund the projects we want to make a difference here? And is the foregone revenue uh, a scenario that we think is reasonable to ask our taxing district partners to participate in? Um, and recognizing that you're not gonna have it perfectly right that development could go slower or faster than you're anticipating, but just trying to be as reasonable as you can, given what you know about the history of the area and the potential for future development here. And a lot of times that final decision <clears throat> comes from direction from the city's finance director, um, working with Doug, community development director and, and the um, city manager, just saying, <clears throat> what do we really think is realistic to use and what are we what are we comfortable using so we we lay out the scenarios and I think Nick did a great job of saying you know between five and six is is about what you're getting I I um, while Nick was talking he's probably doing it right now I went into the spreadsheet and put 4.13 percent um, instead of that the larger numbers so those averages then come down to about 4.24 for the county and 4.89 for the city. If, if you put in something much less than that big growth. Yeah, that, that one year, if you, if you look just at growth between now and 2018, before that big jump occurred, uh, the percent growth long term of the city is 4.8%. Yeah, so that came up with the same number as when, when I just arbitrarily changed it to four point something. So that, it, we need to find out what that big jump was, and it's probably either an e-zone property that came on or an annexation, Doug, or something like that. I can but tell you, this is Matt Zook. I can give you uh, some insight on that. I just uh, connected via phone, so uh, if I can jump in on this at this point, Sure, I like your picture, Matt. Sure, sorry, it's a personal account. <laughs> uh, 
and there's no baseball this year, so it's it's <laughs> nice to be able to see that every once in a while. Uh, in twenty in 2018, uh, the there was a, a couple uh, major events that occurred. The primary one that you probably are somewhat familiar with is the Comcast settlement. Uh, Comcast settled with the state, uh, and that affected uh, quite a number of jurisdictions. But in in Newburgh, what that did was uh, it there was a retrospective amount of set of that uh, adjustment as well. Uh, and so that moved that 2018 tax assessed value growth artificially down to that 2.67%. And because that was a one-time event, uh, it makes the next year uh, look, you know, 7%. Uh, it makes it artificially higher, if you will. And so, uh, you know, Derek Worf uh, is the, the man behind the screen on, on that. He's the EML County tax assessor. But uh, he helped walk me through how that affected Newburgh. And so uh, that, in, in a nutshell, is what's behind that 2018 number and the 2018, 2019 uh, number. But overall, um, you know, you can average those out. It's between two, point, excuse me, 4.2 uh, to 4.5%. Uh, the city is typically, you know, projected tax assessed value at around 4.3%. Um, I've seen some number. I'm looking at some numbers uh, from Derek right now, and uh, that he emailed me last week. And um, you know, that that percentage of growth represents around a you know 40 to 50 million dollar uh, average, maybe more than a 30 million dollar amount. But uh, hopefully, that provides a little bit of uh, high level reasoning as to why you're seeing those numbers. Um, as an anomaly. And I think just for our purposes, again, when Nick and I write the feasibility study, we'll, we'll probably adjust that number or, or do something with that number or we'll put some narrative around it. But we will give the 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 four five six seven percent chart that you see here with the explanation of it like you got in your transmittal memo um and we'll we'll work with the city and get input from you as the advisory committee to figure out what percentage you you want to use knowing that a huge portion of this property is the undeveloped land where you're expecting a lot of growth so you don't want to be too conservative on your growth projections because you do anticipate there'll be huge growth on that property. Well, I, you know, not speaking out of turn, I, I'd be comfortable using what our historical trend has been. Um, I just don't feel comfortable with this number because of that outlier. Sure. Do other people have questions of uh, Nick or Elaine on the financial side of things? I, uh, Angel here, John. Quick question. If we project that uh, on the lower amount and we actually end up um, having more success than we had actually anticipated, that does not affect us adversely at all, does it? Well, so if you, if when you're establishing your urban renewal plan, you say, let's be uh, cautious, let's assume only 4% growth here, we have to be able to uh, justify the maximum in indebtedness that we put into the plan. Right. And so we're not going to, you know, you're going to say, well, okay, we're only assuming 4% growth, but we do not want to assume this urban renewal area lives on forever. We've got to put a, a cut it off at some point. And so let's say no more than 30 years. Well, from that basis, we could establish a financially feasible maximum indebtedness of 52.7 million. If you then get growth that winds up being 7% per year, you could have the ability to fund your $52.7 million maximum indebtedness, I don't know, 15 years down the road. Um, and at that point, you've now funded all the projects you're allowed to because you've hit your maximum indebtedness and your urban renewal area is going to close down real fast 
um, because you were conservative in your projections and actually wound up being much more aggressive than that in reality. Um, so that is a possible situation that can occur. Uh, you know, how bad of a situation that is, is you know, up to the, the eye of the beholder. So. Hey, Nick, can yeah. you do the, this is Molly, can you do the scenario on the other end? Let's say we went with the seven and we got three or four. What's the impact? Yeah, and so that has happened uh, certainly a number of times. Uh, in particular, you know, Elaine and I have been doing this work together for a little over a decade. Um, but right around two decades ago, uh, folks were setting up a whole lot of urban renewal plans right at the turn of the century, forecasting gangbuster growth that then never materialized. Um, in those situations, you uh, can wind up in a situation where an urban renewal plan lingers much longer than anybody wanted it to. One way to prevent that is to put an expiration date in your plan. And you say, okay, the maximum indebtedness is a required limitation, but we are also choosing to say, uh, even though it's not required by law, but we're choosing to say we're not going to issue any debt after 20 years, 25 years, whatever the period of time is. And so in those situations, you can prevent your urban renewal area from lingering on forever uh, because you did put a sunset provision in it, but you still have to deal with the... Um, uh, sort of failed expectations for your community where you went out and adopted a plan with a lot of fanfare that told folks we're going to fund a hundred million dollars worth of projects and in the end you only fund half of those projects and there are streets and parks and whatever else that you planned on funding with this that now never get done um, so that that is the other extreme that you need to you know keep in mind thank you Uh, Doug, this is Cassandra and Nick, this is a, probably a better question for you. Isn't it ultimately a plan of maximum indebtedness for time if you don't have a sunset clause, for example, until you borrow that money? So it could really could go more than 30 years if there isn't a sunset clause if you haven't borrowed up to the MI. Yeah, exactly. So by law, you the, the maximum indebtedness is the only uh, legally required limitation on the plan. And so we try to give you these estimates of at this growth rate for this many years, that's how long we anticipate it would take for you to hit that maximum indebtedness. But that is only a estimate and a projection. And so that is why other communities do uh, on, you know, I'd say maybe 50% of the time, give or take, is uh, communities include these other sunset provisions that say, in addition to the maximum indebtedness, we want to make sure we don't incur any new debt after this date. Right. So for that reason, and I can't speak for other overlapping taxing districts, we prefer to have a sunset clause because if a plan is not performing to expectations after decades, then we don't want to keep writing blank checks. Um, you know, so that's just kind of our position. Isn't it the same check, though? It is, but it goes on for years. So our for that frozen base, what we collect our revenues on, that stays frozen until you reach that maximum indebtedness amount. If no, there isn't a sunset that. clause. No, I understand that, but it would still be the same expectation. You expected to forego X dollars, and instead of it taking thirty years, it took thirty-two and a half years. So same same loss, right? Uh, yeah, it depends on how and when you spend or borrow for that uh, MI, but we just don't like for it to go on and on without it meeting its expectations. All right, are there other questions of Nick? Just in terms of follow-up to Cassandra's question, um, is uh, is there a typical time period that that you would that people do these for if they do have a uh, a termination time limit? Uh, Elaine, you probably have the most experience, you know, being able to answer this anecdotally with the dozens and dozens of plans you've dealt with. So, 
typically if we put in a duration provision along with the maximum indebtedness, it has typically been at the end of a 30 year time period. Um, we, we did that in Milwaukee. Uh, we're putting that in one we're doing in Bend right now. Um, I'd have to go back and look at Cornelius and see if we just made the estimates or if we put a duration in and I'll, I'll make sure and check that um, before our next meeting. But it's, it's, it's typically if you're going to start limiting, you do that at the end of the 30 year time period um, and, and not, not a 25 year time period. But I'll, I will check um, the Cornelius one also. We, um, you know, when we have these tools like, hey, you can expand the footprint by a certain percentage. If you put in that time limitation, is that something that somebody, some council in 15, 20 years can change? And if so, how do they do that? So it depends on how you structure the amendment section of your urban renewal plan. Um, I believe in Bend, we said that if you're going to change the duration, you had to do it um, by, I'm gonna have to check, but I think we said you had to do it by uh, notifying all the taxing districts and doing an additional consult and confer, even though it's not a substantial amendment by statutory requirements. So statutory requirements are if you increase your maximum indebtedness, um, it's a substantial amendment. But if you <clears throat> change the duration, you, you either address that in the amendment section of your plan separately and, or you assume that it's just a minor amendment. And a minor amendment can be done by the agency by a resolution. So, Typically, if we put in a duration provision, we also have the discussion with the locality about that amendment provision to, to make sure everybody understands and agrees with what the process would be to change that provision. All right, other questions? Just a quick question. Is there a time uh, limit on when you can add an expansion? You know, we have that ability to expand it. Is, does it have to be done? What if it's done in year 29? Molly, is it an acreage expansion or a maximum indebtedness expansion that you're referring to? Acreage. So let's say it, it hasn't been performing and then you have an opportunity, you expand, it starts performing. This is the concern about putting an arbitrary end date on it right. without understanding all the pieces. And I, it could be just fine, I just don't understand. An acreage expansion can happen anytime during the time frame of the urban renewal plan. So um, there are the limitations. You can do 1% of the existing acreage by a minor amendment, which is just agency resolution. Anything over 1% of your acreage is a substantial amendment, meaning you have to go through the same process as an original urban renewal plan. So it's not a particularly easy thing to do, um, but you may do it at any time during the operation of the urban renal area. Sorry, thank you. Mm -hmm. Other questions or comments? Are we at the point where we want to move on to the uh, overall impacts on the other taxing districts? Is that what we want to do next, Doug? Yep. Yes, okay. John. Okay, let's go ahead and move on then. So I just put this chart in to help you reference in the material that we sent out. It had much more detailed information for you to look at uh, for the impacts annually for each taxing jurisdiction for each um, four, five, six, and seven percent. So these are just the totals. Um, I just, in, in terms of looking at slides on a PowerPoint, putting all that other information up becomes cumbersome. But this is just to compare what those actual impacts, if you 
project that amount of maximum indebtedness um, that was on Nick's chart earlier. These are what those annual impacts add up to over a 30 year time period for each of the four, five, six, and seven percent scenarios. The two taxing districts <clears throat> that are different are the school district and the education service district. Those are different because they are not a direct impact. All of the other taxing districts is a direct impact to their um, tax receipts from the assessor. For the school district and the education service district, those are we call indirect impacts because they are funded through the state school fund on a per pupil allocation. And a per pupil allocation is set by the legislature and the state school fund excuse me, is made up of a number of sources, including the property tax revenues. So yes, urban renewal impacts the permanent rate property tax revenues that go to the state school fund, <coughs> excuse me, but they don't directly impact, at least no one's been able to identify that direct impact on that per pupil ratio. Any questions on, on these? I can go into it in more detail if anybody wants. Uh, I'll go ahead and ask a question. This is Joe. Um, so the direct and indirect, do you mean that over the 30 year period, there'd be about a $59.5 million at the 7% number from the Royalty Bottom? Um, yes. Impact to the state uh, school fund. Impact the state school fund. Okay. Coming from our local revenue. Correct. On the other hand, then that local revenue stays in your community to do projects right. within your yeah. community. And the state, right, and the state balances that out from the, the state school funds. I, that's just what I was trying to figure out is that yep. that's what you're talking about. Okay. Correct. And just another quick question. This is the one where there is discretion. If we got into a 7% that the committee could start funneling money to these groups earlier than the end of the urban renewal, right? Under any scenario, an urban renewal area has the ability to do what's called an under levy. Okay. Um, <clears throat> that, in fact, given the COVID-19 that we're going through now, I've been talking with a number of urban renewal areas about um, whether or not they would want to under levy next year just to help address economic issues from that. Um, whether or not you under levy really depends on how much money you're getting in and how much um, money you have obligated to do projects and whether you have excess funds that you can redistribute. If you redistribute through an under levy, it's, <clears throat> you can't pick and choose which district you want to distribute to. It's to everybody proportionately. So that kind of sounds like you could do that on a, uh, one-off sort of basis. You may. Oh. So I've had cities, uh, the city of La Grande um, does an under levy, uh, not every year, but they, they do it based on when they have demand for their funds in urban renewal for, because they're mostly just doing loans to businesses. So if they don't have loans lined up, um, for the next year, they'll go ahead and under levy that amount and it goes back to the taxing districts. They make that decision annually. So they don't, they don't obviously have bonding and stuff. They do not. <clears throat> and then Nick and I work in Wilsonville where one of their districts um, under levies every single year, they, they pass a resolution by city council and ordinance basically requiring them to under levy every single year till the end of the urban renewal area. So they made a long-term decision. And, and so if the agency, can they make that decision um, for a dollar figure and then it gets proportionally distributed back? That's how it is made. Huh? No, sir. There's a, a lot of mathematics and Nick can smile at this. You have to figure out an assessed value amount to give to the assessor to say you want to levy on X amount of dollars. 
um, to get your amount of money. So it's, it's not necessarily an easy thing to do, um, but you do do it based on how much you think you want to have in your urban renewal or how much you want to under levy and you can base it on either one of those amounts and you give the assessor an amount on which to give taxes to the urban renewal agency. Are there other questions from the group? Uh, yes, John Angel again. Now we've made other attempts uh, previously. Has this point of discussion has this ever come to the forefront as a, as a catalyst or as a reason for the pushback for the rejection of the urban renewal um, program before or plan before? In other words, what some uh, areas were giving up, believing that I don't think that the urban uh, renewal district is going to generate enough new tax revenues to compensate for the amount that I'm losing over the next 30 years. So I'm just trying to understand that question. Um, are you asking if the concept of this under levy was something that played a, a role in uh, voters voting against it previously? So maybe I should uh, reframe that question. What I'm thinking is if I'm, if I'm a, um, anticipating X amount of dollars, whatever it is, and, and by supporting this, I'm going to forego these many million dollars down in the future. However, because I'm anticipating that that's going to bring new developments, that's going to bring new growth, that's going to bring new tax base that I would have not had had it not been with this um, growth that has occurred through the urban uh, renewal, then I'm willing to forego and put the freeze on my future income in anticipation of this um, growth that's going to be forthcoming. I, I guess my question is, does the city at large believe that we can generate sufficient new revenues to, to um, raise that support by the community in, at large? Is, is that make, did, that, did that make it any clearer? Um, I'll attempt an answer at that. Um, you know, it's impossible to know precisely what all the voters uh, were thinking when they voted uh, to oppose the last levy, and that's the only one I was involved in. Um, uh, and your question kind of poses it from the perspective of each of these agencies. That is correct. Yeah, and the agencies don't vote, so to speak. Um, but I think that um, each of the agencies do, I think all of the agencies are sophisticated enough to understand the point you just made, which is the goal of this thing is to uh, expand and uh, improve the community so that ultimately when the tax rolls go back to them, they have much more than what they were gonna have if nothing was done. Correct. Now, I, I think they're all sophisticated enough to think of that and presume that people making good decisions will drive towards that direction. I don't know that each of those agencies necessarily get out there and tell everybody that that's how these things work. Um, you know, so I, I don't know how that necessarily sophisticated belief gets communicated to the electorate necessarily. And I'll tell you the reason uh, I raised that question is because I, um, as I was reviewing uh, these items, and I, and I thought, for example, on the ed education taxing districts, and I thought, well, if I see that we're going to give up X amount of millions of dollars down the line, and I'm a, I'm a parent that I'm concerned about my child's education, I'm, con I'm concerned about the quality of education and stuff like that, and if I don't have the, the depth and breadth of understanding of that process, just the f mere fact that I feel, wait a second, I'm going to give up this kind of money towards my education or this, the education of our children, I'm going to oppose it and I'm going to vote no. And so I think if, if these are um, the little subtleties that maybe needs more clarity uh, as we speak out to the public, make sure that it's clearly understood that that, um, that true impact. So they understand that you're going to get far more, the anticipation is you're going to get far more than what you're giving up now. 
Well, using the education as an example is, I think, and correct me if I'm wrong here, Elaine or Doug, um, is just the opposite because now under the current law, this 22 million is still gonna go to the school district. Ah. And so what we are doing is we're now t setting that aside for our, the benefit of our community and but the the state does a pure pupil per pupil funding of schools throughout the whole state, so almost all of that twenty two million dollars is still going to go to the school district. It's just going to come from the state, and and not kind of this is where Elaine's talking about direct and indirect. Gotcha. It's going to come directly from property taxes that are paid here. It's going to come indirectly from the state. And when we do our Urban Renewal 101 presentation in online open house or virtual open house or whatever we're getting, um, we, we do make that question very, um, we, we do address that about the impact to the schools. And that's a really good question because in most, many, many communities, that's their first question is, does that mean we're going to have nearly $60 million less that are going into our schools? Right. And so that we, we address that right up front. I, yeah. One other thing on your past urban renewal areas, when, when you tried those before, urban renewal did have an impact on both general obligation bonds and on local option levies. And so people's property taxes indeed could go up because of urban renewal because of the way that was structured. That's not true anymore. And this urban renewal plan will only have an impact on permanent rate property tax levies. So yes, it has an impact on the taxing districts, but that impacts on the taxing districts. The individual property tax payer does not see an increase on their property taxes due to urban renewal. Thank you very much. Elaine, this is Cassandra. Um, I'm curious just about the impact from school districts. Aren't all urban renewal districts statewide? They do impact the amount of revenue that gets sent to the state for redistribution on a per student basis. So if the state doesn't meet that, then they're taking money from other state funds to make the pure proof. So it's, I don't think it's completely accurate to say that there aren't impacts because it does collectively impact the statewide revenue, which could impact where the state grabs money from. Is that accurate? That's accurate. And that's why we say it's indirect. Um, and we try to make sure people understand there are other funding sources than property tax revenues in the state school fund. So income tax revenues, um, federal subsidies, uh, lottery funds. So property tax revenues are a portion, and you're right, Cassandra, every urban renewal area in the state impacts the state school fund, whether or not you have urban renewal. Yeah, and I guess, uh, check me on this concept. <laughs> I was talking with Doug about this this morning. If, uh, if a community doesn't have an urban renewal district, aren't they effectively kind of subsidizing all the other communities that do have urban renewal districts? And that's uh, partially what I was alluding to when I said that $59 million stays in your community yeah. uh, and, and you get to use that in your community instead of it going to the state school fund. So yes, other urban renewal cities who are doing urban renewal across the state are able to use those funds that would have gone to the state school fund locally to do things in their community. And if you don't have a renewal, you're not able to do that. So, yes. Other questions on this piece? I guess the only question, and I don't know where we do this in the process, John, so slot it in wherever. Um, do the numbers look okay to our representatives from the, you know, Cassandra and Joe? I know it's an offset indirect thing, but the people, the indirect, the 
the other tax districts? Do they, are the numbers what you expected? Do you have concerns? Uh, whom are you aiming that question at? Uh, anybody listed on that table, sorry. I, I okay. forget what they're called. Ah, the other taxing you? district. Okay, so your question is to all of the uh, CPRD, TVF and R, yes. do those numbers look like what they were expecting to see? Yeah, or any concerns, because that's at the end of the day, right? This is the need we have to meet. Okay. Um, I could just start by speaking for TVF and R. We don't look just at the numbers. We look at the project list and other plan elements to kind of do that return on investment and that calculation of value. So it'd be a little bit early for me to guess what my policymakers would feel in the absence of a project list, but based on our discussion from the past meetings, and there being a big focus on that infrastructure, roads, utilities, et cetera, it would, I would expect that it would be fine as long as that project list looks like it would invite the private investment. Thanks. And I don't think Don Clements is here. Um, and we don't, I don't think have anybody else from any of the other agencies. The city. Oh yes, the city, I suppose, yes. Who's going to speak for the city, Doug? You or Matt? Matt, are you still on the line? Yes. So, so go ahead. We we had some long range projections that we that we do, and you know I've never um, projected only a three percent growth, so. You know the impact uh, we would have to certainly you know include into our our planning um, you know long long range I mean the, the 11 million for a four percent uh, you know that's uh, not too far off uh, I mean I, I think we could we could handle that um, you know but what I'd have to do a little bit more of what uh, Sandra I mean Cassandra would be doing is just kind of running that uh, taking these numbers and running it through our long range planning which I have yet to do but uh, and then seeing how that would affect, uh, you know, the city's uh, ongoing revenue. Uh, I, a 1%, uh, you know, impact uh, isn't, uh, I have to, you know, run that through. It might be $150,000 to our, our budget. Um, I'd have to, you know, run that through, though. Uh, so that's my initial high take on it. Doug? Well, so this gets back to, I think, a lot of the conversation of looking at, you know, what might be a potential list of projects, given the numbers that Nick has put together on the growth rate of four to 7%. Um, and then Matt putting, as he indicated, putting the numbers into our, our long range financial model to see what those are. You know, we haven't gotten to the point of putting anything into our model yet because we needed to have the conversation with the committee uh, to get your insight and, feed and feedback about you know, what do you think about 4% or what do you think about seven or, or something that's kind of in between. Um, but it also at our last meeting, we went through an extensive list of potential projects um, based upon plans that we had put together from the riverfront to the downtown. Uh, and then what I'll call kind of the subset elements out of our, our water, wastewater and storm plans. And I think we're going to get to that kind of in the next portion of tonight is, is talking a little bit about some of those overall the high level project numbers. So again, we're like everybody, we need to, you know, sit down and look at all of the numbers and be able to come back and share that with the committee. Thank you. All right. Does anybody else have any other questions on the uh, taxing district impacts? Hearing none, I think we will move to that next page, which I think is you, right, Doug? That is correct. Um, so as I mentioned last month, we kind of walked through that, that list that the committee had asked for, of what kind of projects were we thinking about? And they were focused on, on infrastructure, transportation, water, uh, wastewater, and stormwater systems. Move the slide um, down. Oh, did I not do that? I'm bad at multitasking. 
the um, and so uh, Brett Music, our senior engineer, we took those numbers that we shared with you last month, and we, as we indicated, we've updated those to 2020 values. So what you have up on your screen now is uh, those uh, uh, revised numbers. And so in the downtown area, we're looking at $38.5 million worth of, of, of projects. And there's some in there that we would have to talk about that may not be eligible for urban renewal funding. And then in the riverfront plan area, where again, we're about $49.5 million. And so that came up to a little bit over $88 million. Um, I've passed on to Brett as well uh, with the committee's identification of a boundary. And there were a few projects uh, in the downtown area, um, up along Sheridan Street, down along 3rd Street, um, some north-south roads between 2nd and 3rd that were not in our downtown plan. So Brett's going to be working up some numbers for those. In addition to that, uh, one of the subconsultants is working on some planning level estimates for undergrounding the overhead utility lines along 2nd Street and looking at some pedestrian ADA improvements along 9th Street. And if we have some funding, also looking at some of those improvements along, along Lane Street. So consider these to be a preliminary set of numbers. Um, we will continue to revise those and I would imagine bring uh, those revisions back at a future meeting, likely in June. Any questions on that? So I take from that that the number would only go up? Well, there's going to be a little bit. I mean, okay. yes, there will be some numbers that go up, but there's also a riverfront project. Uh, that was addressing Wynuski Street that would have been part was outside of the proposed uh, okay. district boundary. So that project was four million and it might two million of that might go away. But then you might backfill that with a couple million dollars of these other projects based on boundary that I just gotcha. mentioned. So we need to work through those numbers over the course of the next month or so. But the 88 is it, it might vary plus minus a few percent, but it's not you're not talking about a big shift. I'm not anticipating a big shift, but yeah, until Brett can get in there and actually do the calculations, uh, I won't know what the exact answer is. Makes sense, thanks. So Elaine, um, you know, Nick was pointing out a couple of the main lines to be looking at the financial projections. Yes. And so I guess, you know, you start thinking about the financial projections, like at the 5% was $75 million. And here's a project list that's already almost $90 million. Do you have a typical, you know, developer uh, percentage uh, on these projects or, you know, recaptured money because you did a, a, a local improvement district or you did something, you know, maybe there was an advanced financing piece. So is there typically a percentage that we might see that the project list would exceed the amount that we can get out of the plan? That's a, a really good question. And unfortunately, that answer doesn't typically come from our end. It typically, typically would come from the city's end to say, well, we've got SDCs of X amount that can be allocated towards some of the transportation projects, or we have um, you know, this other funding source, or there are some um, state grants that we might be able to get. So usually that kind of information, we, we developed this whole list here and, and this list doesn't have administration on it. So that, that would also have to show up here someplace. And then we look to the city and say, given this list and given what other funding sources you have, what do you anticipate could be funded from your other funding sources. And Nick, are you still on the line? Yeah, I'm still here, yep. I don't think we ever have any kind of a set percentage. I think every city varies widely on that. Would you concur? Yeah, it varies from, from jurisdiction to jurisdiction. 
one one thing I do want to add is that I believe the eighty eight million dollar project cost, I believe those are in twenty twenty dollars. Yeah. So if we're looking at the earlier slide of financial capacity, we don't want to compare that to the maximum indebtedness line item, which is in future inflated dollars. We want to compare it to the line just beneath that capacity in twenty twenty dollars. So let's say we wound up with a 5% projection is what we thought was reasonable. That shows that over 30 years, we would have capacity for 41 million of projects, which is actually less than half of the project list that we have here. That's not uncommon. Uh, it's very common for urban renewal areas when they're getting set up in the feasibility stage to identify a list of project costs that greatly exceed their estimated capacity. And then it really is a game of trying to decide which ones are highest priority and then which ones you think you could uh, wrangle other funds for, whether that's your own city funds for SDCs, like Elaine said, whether it's developer funds, um, either them building some of these projects directly or paying through an LID or having a supplemental SDC in place on them, uh, or for certain things, particularly when it comes to parks and trails, whether you're able to you know, pursue grants uh, or any other external sources for it. Um, but yes, yeah, certainly compare this project list to the capacity in 2020 dollars. And then you're right, it's all, a, it's all looking for what are other funding sources that we could reasonably assume we might be able to get over the next two, three decades here. And will we um, have a conversation where the city gives us that uh, information? Yes, we will be working with the city. Once we get this list completed, um, as we get ready for both the city council briefing, because they'll have some of those similar questions and, um, and ready for your next meeting, which is in June, I think June 8th, we have the schedule coming up. We'll be, we'll be looking at, at those questions because um, you don't have to make all those decisions now. This is just a feasibility study. It, it raises all of the issues. It says this is the amount of money given these kinds of estimates. This is a potential um, project list. These are other potential funding sources. And given that information, a, a decision is made whether or not you then want to take those next steps of preparing an urban renewal plan, narrowing down that project list, or identifying where there are other sources of funding that will help fund those projects um, and, and move forward. So those decisions typically aren't made in the feasibility study phase. The feasibility study phase really presents the financial information, a boundary, a potential project list, so if information to glean from, for making decisions, if you decide to move ahead. All right, but it does seem to go to the heart of whether the project will be successful. Yes. Okay, are there other questions on the preliminary project costs or comments? Don't hear any, so then I, think we maybe want to talk about the open house? Yes. So what brilliant ideas have you come up with? <laughs> well, Cassandra warned us about this um, when we had our last meeting that we uh, probably wouldn't even have a meeting of our advisory committee, much less a, an open house. So um, Doug, Lacey, and I had a discussion today uh, about this issue. Remember in our last meeting, we talked about the open house and said that the, we, we would have uh, two different um, scopes of information. So the first one's mostly providing urban renewal information. What is it? How does it work? Um, why is the city looking at it? Um, and just an urban renewal 101, basically. And then the second open house was to talk more about what are the kinds of things the city might do? What are the projects? What are the financials? 
So on this first discussion, number one, Lacey said, well, you can't really call it an, an open house because <laughs> for <laughs> not an open house. Um, but I, I, I do have, uh, we've de developed what we think is a really good urban renewal 101. And I forbend um, in a meeting that I'm having tomorrow, we taped all of our audio that went with that PowerPoint so that it's going to run like a movie, kind of. Um, so I, I told Doug and Lacey that we could do that for this first phase and Lacey could put that up on the Facebook and transmit it to your different groups and put it up on your website to just start giving information. Um, we also have that fact sheet that you all reviewed and Lacey said um, now that some of this COVID-19 stuff is slowing down a little bit that she's looking forward to producing some of that um, input, some of that text uh, through all the methods she uses to distribute information. Um, so we, we, Scott and I in my office could go ahead and develop a, an Urban Real 101 with a voice over it that we can post and transmit that at least starts our process. Um, and as, as we move into looking at June and July, I think we'll know more about what we might or might not get to do. And maybe we end up doing online survey, um, a, a, another PowerPoint that's narrated, something else if, if we can't actually have in people meetings. But it would be great to hear if any of you have any thoughts and, and uh, and ideas. Well, let's start with Cassandra. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness. Are you um, gonna tell us when we'll never be able to meet? Yeah, really. Well, and um, I don't know whether or not the governor is gonna go for it or not, but there's a lot of people, a lot of agencies petitioning her to try to keep the stay at home order in effect through mid June. So it really could be a while. So I like your idea of doing something creative. I don't know if you've seen the city of Tigard has um, kind of an urban renewal one-on-one -on -one that's specific to their city. Um, I think it's actually pretty clever and pretty cute. And if you put in Newburgh specific things and you mailed postcards to people in advance with you know, a date that it's a go live um, and try to leverage the social media platforms that you could get some engagement there with folks and maybe challenge those of us on the committee to, you know, recruit people to participate if you were to do some kind of um, town hall type forum. I've participated in a few with some elected officials that actually had quite a number of people on them. I mean, dozens of people on them and they actually worked to get across information with a slide deck much like you had that kind of walked through. So it's definitely not the same as a nice open right. house, you know, charrette type thing, but you have good information to share. So what's your plan? I mean, I, I like the idea before where we were doing two separate meetings. Right. We were trying to get your same group to be at both the educational and the second follow-up meeting. Is there a kind of thought process on how you might engage that second communication? I think um, Lacey, who couldn't come to this meeting tonight because she had a meeting online class to go to, um, I think she has a really good handle on social media. Um, she's much younger than I. She knows a lot more information about how all that works. Um, she, I, I think there's way to, ways to gather information of who, you know, who might see the first one and have them provide information so we can notify them when the second one's ready um, and to put it out in the same different media types as, as she uses for the first one. I, I think we'll know more once we do the first one and see if, if we get any views of it or get attendance to it or 
So I, I think it's worth it to try. I love the tiger. Um, it's an animation. Yeah. It was really expensive. They got a huge Metro grant, um, like $340,000 or some incredible amount of money that wasn't just for that animation, but it was for their whole project, right? So they had a big budget for um, that, that kind of stuff. And that animation um, was really expensive. Um, what I'm talking about doing is not nearly as, as uh, fun as that animation. And maybe Doug and I need to talk about whether budgets get changed or something to, to find something that's more fun to do or more, because you're right, Cassandra, it's very clever. Um, is, and um, Is our budget essentially lacing? No, we have a small budget with JLA. They produced that fact sheet that we handed out at the last, they're a public relations firm, public input firm. Um, they produced that two page handout that we gave that uh, we haven't yet distributed and Lacey's getting ready to start doing that. Um, things you know, got interrupted a little bit <laughs> on city priorities. Um, but we have some other money, but we really thought that, that the rest of what we would use JLA for was once we started doing a plan and report, putting together those other little pieces to make sure people understood what was going on and um, you know the little postcard mailers and getting people to the public hearing and so but but that was that was pre all of this, right? It was pre-COVID-19. So maybe we have to relook at what we thought we're going to do uh, with, with that money and, and see if something else is better. I'm, I'm not sure. Well, I think Cassandra's point about it needing to be Newberg is oh, an yeah. important one. Um, but I mean, not just you and a slide deck. Um, there are some resources though, locally, like uh, there's a guy named Brandon Porter that shoots a lot of local video of businesses. There's um, uh, uh, there's also at least two or, or three other kind of local PR um, providers that do it on a professional level. Um, and so I think you have the ability to work with some of those younger technology, uh, younger minds to put something that's a bit of what your educational piece is at the 101, but make it what is, is Newberg. Right. And I think that like with Brandon Porter, he has a bit of a public service component to what he's doing. And so I think he would be willing to try to assist us in doing something like that. And frankly, the other two women I'm thinking of, their names escape me right now. Um, one has a retail store and is very artistic and creative. And one's over in Dundee. I can't remember her name off the top of my head either. I think those are great suggestions and, and we should follow up with them, Doug and Lacey and, and I, um, and, and to see. And Francisco, um, can you chime in here? Um, who, who might be another resource there? Uh, I like the Brandon Porter idea. Um, okay. Well, maybe you can think about it. Uh, reach out to him and maybe think about other uh, people that might be helpful like that. I would okay. also recommend Brian Groves with Jungle Media. Oh, yeah. That's another name. Good job. He has all of his own video equipment, editing equipment, software, and he um, he's also well known locally, especially among the professional group. Right. And who's the uh, um, who's over at um, the retail store that's over by Coffee or Coffee Cat? One across. That was Advanced Media, and they closed. No, I'm talking about that. Actually, the pulp and circum. Yeah, pulp and circumstance. Who's Jennifer? the Jennifer Sitter? Yeah, and isn't she the person that- Ashley Lippard has the marketing term. 
Yeah, and that's that, a, that's Ashley, Ashley Lippard Designs, but I don't think there's video content. She does graphic design and promotional, but. But it's a good idea might. to check George Fox, right? Because we have, we have perhaps opportunity to work with them as well. Yeah, no, that's a good idea. Hey, the other thing about the second meeting would have been scheduled after the middle of June. So it's not necessarily that we can't have an open house for the second meeting. Right, we don't know that yet. We don't, right. we don't know. So I think trying to figure out <clears throat> what we can do well for the first one and start thinking about what the second one becomes as we get closer and know what our capabilities are. So yeah, this is the slide on the next steps. Um, so Doug has a briefing on May 4th, and that's just really to get them up to speed on what we've been talking about. So the boundary, um, the financial scenarios we talked about tonight, the potential huge project lists that, you know, just lists all potential projects so that they, they know where we are. Um, we obviously won't be doing an, an open house thing online before May 4th. Um, so that, that briefing will be with, with input from you guys and input from the technical part, but it won't have any public brief, pub, public addition to that. So in between, um, our draft feasibility studies due uh, for you guys to review. It's due June June fifteenth, so you would have a meeting June 29th. June eighth, we have another scheduled meeting with you with you all, um, and we had scheduled that other open house on that June eighth date, but it you know it doesn't have to be on that date. It can be later. So the the dates we know we're going to meet. Doug's going to do the May fourth briefing. Um, we're going to keep the June 8th meeting and be hope to be able to give you more information on the project list then to have those other things identified that we had down at the bottom to think about what the admin costs to think about what other sources of funds the city has if any um, so to just walk through that with you guys a bit and then Keep in mind while we're going through all of this planning for whatever that other public input piece is going to be, knowing we can't really define that quite yet. Okay, um, so Doug, is there, um, are you envisioning the May 4th thing as something you're handling by yourself? That was the intent is for me to give a briefing to the council where we're at. Um, I would always take support um, from the chair or the vice chair or committee members to participate. It will be a virtual, but will be a Zoom meeting as well. Um, Do you have a sense about what time? Is it part of the informal or the formal? It's part of work session, so it start at six and be over by no later than seven as they go into their regular business meeting. Okay. Well, I, I can assist with that if... Um, it's useful. Okay. Doug, I'm already participating on May 4th for the, um, for the Chamber's third quarter report. So if it's helpful, I can log on early and give support as well. Thank you, Shannon. And uh, mm. before we get to this, uh, I, maybe we should have, give an opportunity for questions or comments about the, what might be a video and audio um, URA 101. Does anybody have any comments or input for Doug and or Elaine? I certainly think it might be good for us to see it. Uh, and sure. when, when might that be available for us to look at? Well, Doug and I just talked about it today, so I am not sure. But as soon as I know, I will tell Doug and have him. Um, send it out. I, uh, Scott in my office does a, a lot of this creative stuff, so I gave him this task today and 
Um, we're going to talk tomorrow just about what it might entail and, and, and how it will work. So we'll keep you updated. But definitely we would, we, we would want to do it sometime in May. So that, that's a hope. Yeah, we can also test it with people who haven't been through these meetings because we're probably not the, we're not a good target audience for a test. We have, we know too much. That's a good idea. All right, um, anything further on that piece? And then how about this uh, schedule? Is there any comments or questions on the, the schedule and being flexible about how we adjust? <laughs> I would just say that uh, right now we're anticipating that we'll probably have a Zoom meeting on uh, June 8th. Okay. Um, so I guess maybe the good of the order. Does anybody have anything they'd like to discuss? Nothing other than a great job, Doug, on bringing us together. Oh, you're welcome. It wasn't me. It was it was city staff who pulled this all together. Like I said earlier, I'm just the camp host. <laughs> all right. Well then, uh, if there's nothing further, then I guess we'll sign off. And thank you all for participating. I think it actually went pretty well, given how we had to conduct it. So I appreciate your input. All right. Thank you, guys. Thank you. We're adjourned. Thank you. Thank you all. All right, goodbye.